We are in Genesis 37. Tonight we're going to start with, so that we don't try to put this in the Bible and make it some fanciful story, we're going to put it in a very modern day context. So this next slide is going to be a video that, from YouTube of pretty much a modern day context of Joseph. Posting an image. A man has been murdered a week after posting an image of his wife on Facebook with $60,000 in her hands. Last week, Tony Harris, a 50 year old electronics repairman, showed his wife, Amber Crane, grinning up at the camera, clutching thick stacks of cash in both hands. More money sat piled in her lap. I misplaced $60,000. I hope my wife didn't go shopping with it. The caption joked. So that is Genesis 37 in a very modern day context. We have somebody who has something they've been given, or they've worked for, they've earned, and they show it off. And it ends with, obviously, being robbed and murdered. Usually we would assume in the Bible things don't sound like that or look like that, and it looks exactly like that tonight. Genesis 37, Joseph's dream. Starting in verse 1. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned, in the land of Canaan. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, so Joseph is 17 years of age, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. While he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought back a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Then Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Please listen to this dream which I have had. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep rose up, and also stood erect, and behold, your sheaves all gathered around and bowed down to my sheep. Then his brothers said to him, Are you actually going to reign over us? Or are you really going to rule over us? So they hated him even more. For his dreams and for his words. Now he had still another dream. And he related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowed down to me. He related it to his father and to his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have had? Shall I and your mother and your brothers actually come? to bow ourselves down before you to the ground? His brothers were very jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. How much pride does it take that your brothers are already angry at you? One, you've got a long sleeve coat, or in your Bibles, a multicolored coat. Kind of weird. Two, you go around wearing this all the time. Three, you have dreams that say your brothers are going to be your servants. And you're like, hey, let me tell you something. I got this really good story. Let me tell you all about it. Let me post on YouTube $60,000 in cash and just see if somebody kills me. And that's generally what's happened. And the two brothers that he's working with at first are very important. They're not his brothers. His brothers, the sons of Leah, the sons of Rachel, they're brothers. The other two are not. Zilpah. What is she? What is Zilpah? Come on, what is Zilpah and Bilhah? Ha, ha. So, so they're not quite, I mean, they have the same father, but in reality, they don't have similar mothers. They have handmaids for mothers. And so he's out serving with them. And this order, you've got to learn throughout this. If you don't learn the order of the twelve, a lot of things that happen in this story don't make sense. Reuben is the oldest. Simeon is just dumb throughout the whole story. Levi. And then Judah. The important thing you need to know about Judah here is Judah 
is the youngest good son. That makes sense. The youngest good son. And too often we think in very modern terms. If you have three sons, you would say, I love all three equally and lie your head off, right? Is that fair? The, the truth is that in this time, that's not how it worked. We've got 12 sons here. 11 of them are perfectly equal. One of them is not equal to the others. He is twice as good as the other ones. What's his name? Reuben. Reuben is twice as important as the other ones. He has to take the family business. He has to take the family on. He gets the double portion. The Bible commands that you cannot take a younger child and make him the first one. And Jacob did just that. Look where Joseph is. Way down here. Way down here, right? Very bottom. I mean, Benjamin, little Benjamin, who's tiny at this point, doesn't really count. But he's the youngest son at this point. Minus the baby. And Jacob has elevated Joseph. Because Joseph is the son of the wife that he loved. So let's continue in verse 12, and let's see the, what we would expect to happen in any modern day story. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Shechem's where they got in trouble and got chased out of. It's a bad idea from the start. Then his brothers went to pasture their father's flock in Shechem. Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. Then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. A man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, What are you looking for? He said, I am looking for my brothers. Please tell me where they are pasturing the flock. Then the man said, They have moved from here. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. When they saw him from a distance and before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Now then come and let us kill him. Throw him into one of the pits and we will say, A wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard this and rescued him out of the hands and said, Let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him. That he might rescue him out of their hands to rescue him to his father. So it came about when Joseph reached his brother that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him. And they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty, without any water. Then they sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, the caravan of Ishmaelites were coming from Gilead, where their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh, on their way to bring them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What profit is us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then some Midianite traders passed by, so they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. Thus they brought Joseph into Egypt. Honestly, when we're reading this story, we're so tempted to put it in a Bible context and go, uh, you know, fancy story. But in reality, this is generally what we'd expect. If somebody's dumb enough to put up a video showing sixty thousand dollars, if some guy is dumb enough. So one, not only after you've ticked off your brothers by ratting them out, you then go and then tell them your beautiful dream that consists of them, you know, bowing to you because you're so much better than them. Remember, Joseph is getting bowed to by Reuben, Judah, Simeon, Levi, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun. All should be more important than Joseph. And then not only does he do that, he shows up. To check on them wearing what? And not that very color. He wouldn't show up flashing cash, would he? He wouldn't show up going, I'm the favorite. Look at my long sleeve, beautiful coat. 
No, I wouldn't do that. That'd be just, that, that doesn't even make sense. None of y'all would do it. You know, like, I'm going to a bad neighborhood. How much diamonds can I put on my hands? And how many gold necklaces can I find? Let's put some gold earrings on. Shiny shoes. Right? None of us are going to do that. But Judah has this sweet moment where he says, why don't we just get some money off of him instead of killing him? Okay, not really going to go with very good, but better than killing him. And we look at that and we go, Reuben was going to rescue him. And we want to go instantly to Reuben's a good guy in this story. Reuben's the oldest brother. Reuben could have said, very simply, no. Send him home. <clears throat> Reuben was not the older brother in this story. Judah was. Judah is the only one who actually makes a decision because he wants to make a decision. Reuben says, I'm going to wait till they're all gone and then rescue me. And so he, he does Joseph good but he's still got that sense of pride where I don't go to, go to my brothers and go, no, let's, let's do the right thing. Starting in verse 29, we see the last of what they do to Joseph. Now Reuben returned to the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. So he tore his garments. He returned to his brothers and said, the boy is not there as for me. Where am I to go? So they took Joseph's tunic and slaughtered a male goat and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the very colored tunic and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please examine it to see whether it is your son's tunic or not. Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in the morning for my son. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold him in Egypt to plot for Pharaoh's officer, the captain and the bodyguard. They, they brought this news to their father. And, and somehow, in the middle of their father being completely broken, and saying that I will weep till my death. I will mourn to my death. They kept up their story. I got more respect for Reuben at that point. Reuben has a pretty good control of his family. Either that or Judah does. Because they kept up this lie. Even at the point their father says, I will never stop grieving for him. And examining those in the story, the most obvious thing in any of his pride. But we've we talked about Joseph's pride. None of us are crazy enough to flaunt everything we have and think nobody's going to get jealous. Nobody's going to get upset. Nobody's going to be bothered if we flaunt everything that I have. And there are people so prideful that they do that thing. They, they don't notice that their pride overcomes them to the point where God may have blessed them. And they don't get that God spoke of them, a term that we've, we've twisted in the scripture. How many of you have ever been told that women should dress modestly? And I really want you to consider this. This is one of those where the word has changed meaning in time. And most of us, our first answer is modesty means don't show no things. Okay. Is that fair? Don't show no things. I mean, that's the best way I can put it. Don't show nothing, okay? That's how we take modesty. The biblical image of modesty is the almost completely different and has no connection to what I just said. It has to do with things like gold, costly apparel. Well, what do those have to do with modesty? I mean, I could have a long sleeve, very colored tunic on and cover everything on my body, but would I be modest? That would be modest. Modest 
honesty would be, I, I have this from my father, but understand, I'm going out to see my brothers who don't have that. And I say, being modest in the context of the Old Testament and the New Testament talks about being humble. Talks about being shamefaced. Talks about being simple. And so first we have to address the pride we have that's like Joseph's. And we do. We get this idea that, well, it's ours, we've earned it, it doesn't matter. And we forget that just because I have something, it may not be the best to want to. It, it may be the best thing I can do is come to you and try to match you. Do you do what Paul said, right? He said, to all men I become all things so that I may win some. And he's not saying, you know, give up, quit believing the Bible, and then show up and just, hey, I believe what you believe. He's saying when you come to them, dress like them, act like them. Follow the scripture, but meet people where they are and don't. Just assume, I have it. I have every right to wear it. I have every right to look that way. And too many of us are like Joseph. You would have thought he'd figure it out. But he didn't. Because it says over and over this, this same phrase. And they became more mad. They became more mad. They became more mad. You get the point. They're getting madder. And some of us... We need to look at other people and kind of look at their response and say, is my immodesty affecting those around me? Do I make someone else uncomfortable by the fact that they couldn't match me? But then there's, there's, there's another pride. There's Reuben's pride, which if you don't have it, you're probably the exception. Reuben's pride was this, I'm going to do the right thing. But my image, my pride in the way I look to everyone around me is important. I want you to think that I'm a nice guy. I hang out with you. I'm on everything. And, you know, it's okay. Everything's good. You know, I'll go do the right thing in secret. When all y'all have gone to bed, I'm going to go steal Joseph. I want to do my Christianity like this. Hey guys, I'm just one of you. And then they go to bed and I can do the good stuff. They wake up, no, I, I can do nothing. I don't know what happened. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the pitch of the night to go, what is this, Jesus? Nicodemus, a ruler in the synagogue who could have influenced many people because he was a ruler in the synagogue says, I've got that image of being a ruler in the synagogue. And he goes to Jesus at night. He, he's willing to give Jesus his life that isn't secret, but anything on the surface. And we lose all the good story that can come from a Nicodemus. We lose all the good things that can come from a Reuben, who stands up and says, you know what, I've got power. I've got influence. I'm going to use it for God when they can see it. And not be following the crowd or afraid of my brothers. Judah is a really weird type of pride. It's the good old temptation of man then. And it's not that Judah didn't do something better for him. It's just that He's your first thought to rescue your brother. Hey, let's not kill him. And I was like, you know what? Next point should be, let's not kill him. He's our brother. Okay, you don't kill your brother. This is obvious. Cain and Abel, we get the point. Let's not kill our brother. Let's sell him instead. Come on, Judah. And it's that pride of needing wealth as a symbol. Needing wealth as a part of the image. And in all these, the, the theme that runs throughout all of them is this image. Because when they come back to their dad, they don't go, Hey, uh, we uh, sold your son to yeah. some Ishmaelite traders. We sold them. 
because they don't want to look bad in the face of their father. And so no matter which son it is, none of them come clean. Now you think about that. I have enough trouble getting three people to go in cohorts with me and sneak somewhere without somebody being like, hey, guess what we're doing? Shh. Or one of them starts laughing when we're trying to play a practical joke. And that's like three people. He's got 11 people here. Well, 10, because baby Benjamin doesn't do much of this point. He's got 10 brothers right here. No, I'm not coming clean. I'm not going to be honest. Because if I do, I'm going to have to say, well, I was there and I didn't try to stop it. And the fact that they never come clean. They think Joseph is sold off and gone forever, and they never come clean. At the point we meet Joseph, they come back. Still don't know it's Joseph. So they go back again. They finally figure out it's Joseph. And Judah, being the leader of the group, admits they had wronged him. But they had wronged him that long. They had kept something eating away at them because none of them could come clean without giving up the biggest thing that stops us from coming clean. Why is it that we are not more honest about our sins? Why is it that we keep those things which we've done that eat away at us to ourselves? What is it? What is that one thing? Because there's only one thing. The more we keep something to ourselves, the more it hurts us. So what is that one thing in our life that destroys the mightiest kings? That comes before the fall and keeps us in the fall? Come on, what is that that comes before the fall? Pride. And most of us can get, whether we, you know, we get Reuben's, whether you get Judah's or whether you get Joseph's pride, all of us connect with the other ones. All of us do. All of us have sin in our life. And we keep it because we're ashamed of being seen for what we really are. But, but the thing about keeping secrets is you can keep secrets from everybody else. You can never keep it from yourself. Most murderers are caught in a really sneaky way. I love forensics and stuff. I watch all those weird movie shows. It's like 24. It's like, they start a real story. No, it's not. And I love them, and I'm just, I get so into them. And then I watch, you know, Diz Discovery Channel, and they're like, let me debunk what really happens. And they're like, oh, that's no fun. They come in, and 90% of crimes are solved because somebody confesses. Because somebody cannot bear with that secret. If I know the consequences of life in prison, I, I think I'd be better at keeping a secret. I'm just saying. And these people who are facing a life sentence or a death sentence even, confess because that secret may be kept from everyone else but the person who knows it too big for. This morning we talked about what? We talked about the weight of glory. And, and this is kind of the weight of pride. This is that, that weight where could you imagine if Joseph had just given up his pride for a second? Said, you know, I know I have that nice coat, but I'm going to wear this old coat of mine. Because I know my brothers don't have what if Reuben had given up that pride of looking the part and said, guys, we need to stop this. We don't actually kill our brothers here. That doesn't work. And what if any of the ten, any of them, had come clean to the father, and you know he would have, if he's sending his favorite son to Shechem, he's sending ten sons to Egypt. And that's not the story we get. Because we started with a true story to get to this point. 
These are not stories in a book that just, they work in Jesus' land. They work in God's system, but not in ours. Th these are everyday stories of what exactly we think would happen. How many of y'all thought that I made up that YouTube video? Remember that YouTube video? How many of y'all thought I made that up? Well, of course not. I'm really bad with computers, but... <laughs> But none of you go, no, that doesn't seem like a true story. I don't think that would happen. You're like, yeah, if somebody's flashing $60,000 on public media, somebody's going to take somebody out. Kind of makes sense. They're going to rob you. They're going to kill you. They're getting that $60,000. And then we come to this, and we don't want to put ourselves in there and go, you know what? I am one of the ten. What is it? Rat, snitch. Come on, help me out. Rat, snitch. What is it? Come on, give me some of these words. Narc? Yeah, I like them good. Okay. What's the tattletale? Okay, I was trying to go children's level for a second. You notice I went straight to games. Um, tattletale. Uh, right? And we have all these terms for these people who are honest. And we try to make it this terrible thing. Joseph is not dead at this point. He's just been sold, and if one of the ten gets this clear conscience and goes, they were heading in this direction, we got a chance. We might be able to catch up. That's where we usually sit. We usually sit as one of the ten and just sit there and we go, we've got this secret, but if we came clean, we'd look bad. And the only way to solve the situation for us is to come clean. But this is a real life story. Because there's certain things that I would tell you I have sent. And the problem is, if I tell you other sins, I don't get to work next week. It's true. It's so weird that you have certain sins which I tell you and everybody goes, yeah, I did that too. I lied. And everybody goes, ah, oh, terrible person, right? Right? I lied. I really did. I was on the phone and I said, I'm doing nothing. I was all lies. I was doing everything but nothing. That was this week. I just want you to know. Open confession of my sin. And everybody goes, okay, me, I probably did that too. I was probably on the phone and lied about what I was doing. Okay. But the second we slip into a sin that we personally don't like, it becomes a whole other issue. And this one's a pretty big. This is selling someone into slavery. Do you imagine me standing up here today and go, I want to tell you a story that happened. When my brother, when I sold my brother into slavery. I, and I know like, everybody's looking at me going, that would be a weird story. Right? How many of you would go, really? You really don't need to come back. We'll figure out something to replace you. We'll play audio tapes or something. <coughs> But if I came to you and I said, hey, you know what? I was part of a kidnapping spree. There is not a person in here who's going to go, yeah, that's the same as you know, getting on the phone and lying about being on the computer. But we've made something there that's not there. And we have. We've, we've made this idea that if we came clean, we could never admit to it. Well, what if... Somebody talked. You know, I, I come forward here and I tell you, okay, so we kidnapped this guy last week and sold him into Egypt. And what if somebody talked? You know, I, I'm up here on this front queue and I felt a little card. I don't know why I use those. And the person, you know, prays for me because I kidnapped someone. What if someone talked? And the real question at that point is, why am I confessing to something that I'm not really confessing to? All I did was make my secret a wider circle. I, I didn't give it to God and say, God, I don't care. This is me laid out before you. Everyone can know what I am. I'm not ashamed to say that in my weakness, you are strong. I'm not afraid. 
afraid to say that. But that's not really how we work. We say, I will tell it to the church, but you know someone would probably tell someone. And all you've said is, God, I'm willing to give this secret a little more room, but I'm not willing for it to be completely open. I'm not encouraging that person who is the gossip and spreads when somebody comes forward. I'm telling you that if your biggest fear is not giving something to God, what if somebody gossips? Then somebody else knows that you're not perfect. The only thing they've attacked again is your pride. Usually we focus on, you know, salvation. Tonight we're focused more on an invitation of true repentance. True repentance amongst ourselves and it not being one of those where we confess the faults one to another. One of the most uncomfortable scriptures we have. He's confessing our faults one to another. And we, we always offer, you know, if you, if you need prayers. And what all he did today was unusual. But how many of you can honestly admit you've never been in a place like Ollie where you're actually struggling and, and you're trying to balance making a living. I, I love this because this is one of my hardest. Is balance making a living with living for God. And you're actually overwhelmed, and so you just keep it in, keep it in. And how many of us can honestly say that Ollie did something you couldn't do? You, you honestly could not be honest and come open about stuff that you've been harboring in. I mean, honestly. I want you to personally think about those things where that's unusual. How is that unusual? I should have to plan sermons around the invitation time. Be like, I need 15 minutes for invitation. Five if we get a baptism. So that'll be 20 minutes. I gotta finish 20 minutes early so that we can have time for everyone who needs the church. That's, that's not how we come to church though. We come to church with too much pride to say, you know what? I really am struggling right now. I mean, it's we've gone through a time where we doubted God's existence. Okay, come on. I know in half of y'all are lying. It's okay. <laughs> or your arms broke. That's okay. Arms can be broken. I have. I've gone through times. And the weirdest thing is when you represent a minister, no matter where you are, it is the hardest thing in the world to say, I'm really struggling with God's existence. It is this thing I'm serving real. I went to hospice a couple weeks ago and there was a preacher dying. Preachers are the lyingest people I've ever met. <laughs> because they're expected to. They, they are, you know, you, you expect the preacher to have everything together, so they lie about it. And on his deathbed, he broke down every time you could get him alone. Anytime you could get his family out of the room long enough to talk to him, he was in tears, broken down, because he was struggling with God's existence. And if somebody actually came forward and said, I, I don't know if God really exists, I don't, I don't even have a clue how we respond. Because I've never seen it. And, and I fault myself as much as y'all. That too often we're afraid to just be honest and say, you know what? I struggle. I've always wondered how I respond to the invitation. Because if I turn around, I don't think it's normal. And it's not even designed that preachers ever have anything wrong. And it's not designed that members have anything wrong. If you have something wrong, it's the exception. You know, you, you'll tell me about your sickness, you'll tell me about a death, you'll tell me about things that you're struggling with, and you will tell me everything that's going on this level because that's important that it's shared. 
But the second we raise it up just a little bit and we start talking about those things we really struggle with. I don't want to get rid of enough pride to honestly say, God, I don't know if you're there. And if you're going to tell me that no one in this room struggles with that, you're wrong. Statistics have you that probably one in ten of us struggle with the existence of God. That's in the churches of Christ. So tonight, your invitation from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20 and 21. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making appeal through us. We beg you. We beg you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in you. Tonight we have that invitation that consists of believing in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing Jesus as Lord, being buried with Him in baptism, and raised to walk with Him. And we have the invitation that's always offered if anyone needs prayers. And we also have the invitation if anybody wishes to submit to the eldership here. Yes, you come now as we sing, as we sing.